hardwire this thing, which, which I will do. Charlie, I have a question for you. Yeah. Does the computer pick which is the better, the better link, a hardwire or a Wi-Fi, or do you have to manually do it to get I'm it over? That's entirely programmable, and I'm not sure what Apple does. Hardwire this thing. Hardwire this okay. thing. You got the um, sound of the. Um, yeah, I just recording. muted it. Okay. I just muted it, and we're pretty much all set to go on time. Um, Let's I'll hardwire it later. Make, make Charlie co-host. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, there are actually, there are actually going to be people. Uh, yeah, there'll be. I'm there are people not, uh, knocking at the door already, but uh, there's okay. there's six people in the waiting room, uh, yeah. and oh. I'm trying Let to my people to... in. Yeah, I want to make you co-host and get all this 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 yeah. uh, junk done first. Okay. Um, uh, wh where I can't find you, participant. Oh, it's uh, K and S, uh, Karen and Charlie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just can't find you. You're in. The, oh, it's in the waiting room. I'm just going to let people in the waiting room and uh, out of the waiting room, and and then find the find you. There you are. Oh, thank you. Oh, I got a new version of Zoom when when we did all this Apple stuff, and it's it's. Taking a moment just to get used to it. Okay, I'm officially co-host. Okay. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are, or good evening, or, or good middle of the night. Um, welcome to Community Church of Boston. My name is Dean Stevens. I am the fake minister of, of what might be a real church, what might be, a, some people think, uh, not a real church. I don't know what, but it's an amazing thing, and we've been here for 102 years, and, um, and I urge you all to find out more about it at our website, come church, communitychurchofboston.org. Uh, we have a beautiful, uh, amazing, and controversial history. We're located, our physical presence is in Copley Square, we own a five-story building uh, that is our boon and our bane. <laughs> um, it's a big job taking care of it, but it's a wonderful thing. So we welcome you, and we start with the lighting of, of a beautiful candle that I've never seen before. It came out of a drawer in our house because I'm at the house because of the snow, and uh, because I couldn't get out of the driveway. It's a beautiful thing. We will no longer ever have to um, cancel church because of weather. Can you imagine that? And while I'm on the subject, I want to thank Luis Guzman and Thurman Judge. Luis is our cook and our janitor. He came in at 8 a.m. and started shoveling snow and uh, was there until 1 p.m. Thurman came in at 1 p.m. and kept shoveling snow until 5 p.m. And so we thank them for doing that for us. Um, we urge you all to watch your back. And I'm not talking about your enemies. I'm talking about your back and your heart. And I light this candle this morning for the late Thich Nhat Hanh, who we just heard passed on. Thich Nhat Hanh who I don't know much about, but uh, um, I heard the most wonderful interview with him this morning uh, by Krista Tippett. Um, mindfulness, presence in this moment. Um, just a quiet moment for Thich Nhat Hanh. It's snowing tonight, the silence of white, magical sight in its wonder. It blankets the field, all is concealed, scars are all healed, wounds are covered. The flakes fall in fast, shrouding the past, whose first or whose last doesn't matter. 
It dresses the graves, the princes and slaves, the weak and the brave are all flattered. And we all fall down sometimes when our faith is undermined. But the gentle snow, so kind, sublime, remind us there is mercy in the grace of the design. It buries the bins, the garbage within, veils every sin like a frosting. All motion must wait, business abate, all highways and bridges and crossings. It cloaks every roof, elegant, smooth, quiet, aloof in its mystery. Each twig, every tree in white purity, clearly revealing its history. <clears throat> And we all fall down sometimes when our faith is undermined. But the gentle snow, so kind, sublime, remind us there is mercy in the grace of the design. It falls on the church, it hushes the birch, it falls on all words that are spoken. It glistens and glides and swirls from all sides, drifting in tides like an ocean. High financiers and checkout cashiers, home it is clear they are going. The good and the bad, the sane and the mad are secretly glad that it's snowing. And we all fall down sometimes when our faith is undermined. But the gentle snow, so kind, sublime, remind us there is mercy in the grace of the design. The grace of the divine. That song written by Tom Pacheco. I'm obsessed with, with this songwriter. The song came from his record. It's called Woodstock Winter. He, he uh, recorded this with members of the band, uh, Garth Hudson, Rick Danko, and Levon Helm. It's a beautiful record. Uh, check it out, Tom Pacheco. And I was reminded of that song, of course, yesterday in the middle of that enormous snow. I hope you're having a blessed time during this um, winter event. And I hope you're warm and, and next to your family and comforted and cuddled. Um, and cozy, <laughs> which is what I hope for you and what I, I am about to bring on. I'm so happy that they are with us, Cozy Sheridan and Charlie Koch. Um, join us once more for their lovely songs. They join us from Harrisville, New Hampshire. It's a beautiful thing to have them with us. Take it away, Cozy and Charlie. Thank you, Dean. <clears throat> I love that you started that song because it's perfect what we're gonna follow with. Secretly glad it is snowing. I love that line. Charlie's more than secretly glad it's snowing. He's gonna go skiing. We're delighted to be here with you this morning. What if it'll be okay? What if it works out right? What if there is a new day after this night? What if we turn the corner? What if we make it through? My world is warmer when my world has you. We fall. We fall, my friend, we fall, we get up again. I like stories once upon a time. I like when your hand reaches for If we lean in where it hurts, lean into the mistake. If we lean in where we break, we fall, we fall, my friend, we fall, 
works out right What if there is a new day after this night? We fall, we fall, my friend We fall, we get up again Thank you. Thank you, Cozy and Charlie from Harrisville, New Hampshire. I want to tell you a couple of a couple of things uh, goings on at Community Church. Um, first of all, we had a, a marvelous concert this past Friday night. Jacqueline Schwab, the piano soundtrack voice of many of Ken Burns documentaries joined us for a glorious concert. It was um, beset with a few technical difficulties. It, uh, I, uh, I shared with Edmund Robinson, who, who is her husband and also the, um, the uh, uh, what's it called? Transitional minister at First Church here, three blocks away from us down in Copley Square. Uh, uh, shared with him that it's amazing that a, uh, any bozo on the street can put up their shingle as a, a broadcaster and and start uh, doing concerts like this. But we're doing one every Friday, a music concert, um, up, upcoming this Friday from Maine, uh, Camden. That is is uh, John and Rachel Nicholas. And upcoming uh, are also some other really wonderful performers. You can find the list. I'll, I'll put it up in the chat on our website, communitychurchofboston.org. Um, also, you can find out about upcoming speakers. We have next Sunday, uh, Margaret Morgan Roth Goulet, who's a uh, retired scholar from uh, Brandeis and also a uh, well-written author on issues of, of senior citizens and the rights of seniors and uh, uh, um, discrimination against seniors. Um, and But that's not what she's talking about. She's talking about Nicaragua, which is where she and her husband, David Goulet, uh, go every winter and are deeply involved in a, a sister city project with San Juan del Sur and a high school there. So that'll be a, a fascinating program. Um, <clears throat> February 13th, we have Victor Wallace, who is a, a longtime scholar on socialism, Marxism. He's a journal, uh, he, he, periodical editorial, editor of uh, the, the periodical Socialism and Democracy. And he's a professor at Berkeley College of Music, but he's not talking about any of that stuff. He's talking about his mom, that's Mother's Day. And his mom was a painter uh, who lived in France and we'll be seeing some of her paintings and talking about the legacy of his mom who lived during the, the war years in, in France and then in the United States and then back in France. Her name was Diane Esmond. February 14th, I wanna tell you about a really remarkable program that's filling up really fast with, with uh, attendees. Actually, it's not filling up because there's no limit to how many people can join on, on, on a, a, a webinar. This is uh, a program uh, across the world again, like tonight or today, uh, it, one, one of the speakers is Leila Farsak, who's a professor of political science at UMass Boston. She's a Palestinian professor and uh, she will be in conversation with Jeff Halper. Jeff Halper is a, an Israeli and joining us from Jerusalem. He is the, the, uh, the founder and director of ICAD, which is Israeli Committee Against Home Demolitions. It should be a fascinating program and you can again find uh, on, on our Facebook page or our, our website, the links to, to sign up for that webinar. And to also possibly if, if you're so moved, contribute to two, two organizations who are beneficiaries. One is uh, um, Jeff's group, 
Committee Against Home Demolitions. And the other is Nancy Murray's uh, organization, which is called Gaza Mental Health Project. That's February 14th. I wanna tell you about um, goings on at Community Church at the physical plant, which is not very much going on, believe me, uh, because of you know the, the, the COVID situation and whatnot. But we're there at least every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, Dean and Crystal, who is our publications and office manager, and our just remarkable uh, treasure of, of a fine on our staff. Um, and what, what's happening in the auditorium is that it is inhabited by a lot of books, books from the estate of the late Robert Dottilio. And there are so many books that they take up half the auditorium and the third floor. If you're interested in coming to see these books, and help us figure out what to do with them. They would have gone in the dumpster had we not taken about 10 trips in, in my station wagon and in Thurman, uh, Thurman's truck back and forth uh, from his house in Medford to the church. And um, uh, they're there and we're trying to figure out, it's both a beautiful thing to have so many books. Uh, the, the topic is 20th century intellectual history uh, left, Marxism, socialism, um, uh, every kind of book about anarchism, uh, all these authors that I've never read, like Proudhon and Kropotkin and, um, and Gramsci, and uh, it's quite a list. Also, Saquon Vanzetti, Bob Dottilio was, was the, probably the world's foremost scholar on the Saquon Vanzetti case. All of his papers and, and materials around that are now at the church and we are blessed to have Jerry Kaplan, uh, just retired from Harvard University uh, Press, uh, who is taken on incredible uh, part-time task. He's in every Monday, Wednesday, Friday of curating Bob's collection of papers and books and research manuscripts. Uh, it's, it's a gargantuan task and he is just attacking it with just incredible professional um, acumen and skill. Next, I wanna thank all the donors uh, who at the end of the year contributed greatly to Community Church. Uh, you know your names. And I just wanna let you know that our uh, thanks to Dick Kashishin, who is on the phone here with us today. Uh, all of your statements, uh, year end statements are going out for your tax purposes or for your tax resistance purposes, whatever you like. Um, we are grateful <clears throat> that, uh, that you are so generous. And we are also very excited that we are about to find out and we're very hopeful whether or not we uh, will be receiving a grant from the city of Boston, uh, Community Preservation Act, Historic Preservation to help uh, fix our roof, which is a major task. And uh, we are very hopeful from the indication so far that we will receive this grant and be able to undertake a roof replacement of the second, the, the second, the half of the half of the roof that's the lower part in the back around the, the skylights. I think that's all I have for announcements. Cozy Sheridan and Charlie Coke. We're so glad to have you with us. Will you join us for a couple more songs, what we call the musical message of our meeting program service, whatever it is we call it. Yes. Are we going? Yeah, turns out, here we are. We, uh, for some reason, we thought we were after the speakers, so here we are. One more uh, song after the speaker. Oh, okay. So um, we are really glad to be here today. And we were trying to think of songs that seemed to fit with some of what the speakers were gonna do. So we picked out two. And the first one is called My Fence and My Neighbor. I wrote this when I lived in, uh, we used to live in Maynard, Massachusetts, near you all. And uh, when I first moved there, Charlie already had a house there in Maynard when I met him. So the, when, when I moved into his house, the house next door was empty. For about six to eight months, it remained empty. People looked at it to, to rent it. And one day I called Charlie up when I was touring and he said, a couple has looked at the house next door. And I said, oh, he said, yeah. They're both recently divorced 
and to get between them, they've just gotten together as a couple, and between them, they have five children, five teenagers. And I said, wow. I said, you know that fence we were thinking of putting up between our houses? Maybe we should put it up now. Because our houses were very close together. It was just one house, a driveway, a driveway, and another house, you know, very urban living. And you get used to having an empty space next to you. It feels like it's your yard. So I was, so anyway, we talked about this fence and we ended up putting it up. And then this lovely couple moved in and there was a fence there that hadn't been there when they looked at the house. And here's the lady from next door coming over to say hello. And maybe she's the one to put up the fence, but none of us are gonna talk about it. So we slowly got to know our neighbors over the next year. And it took a while, because I had put a fence up. And then in January 2017, around the time of the inauguration, the world started to look really unsafe to me. And I was wishing I had gotten to know my neighbor better. So I could have gone over and knocked on her door and had a cup of coffee with her. But I hadn't. So instead, I sat in my office and I wrote this song. When the neighbors first moved in, I am the one who built the fence. I'm the kind who can't hold out her hand if I know my line of defense. We are living in interesting times. The sky falls every day And I used to think my fence Could make the world go away But this morning all I know Is I want to fall down and cry This morning I don't need my I need my neighbor on the other side. I've seen my neighbor with her children in the morning. She's driving them to school. I've seen her play a game in the driveway. She knows how to sit and bend a rope. And I don't know that much about her But I dropped in and we talked at her store And each time I come away Wanting to know a little bit more And this morning all I know Is I want to fall down This morning I don't need my fence I need my neighbor on the other side I'm not the first one to a protest And I am the last one with a sign And I mostly want to be left in peace to make my pre-design And I don't know from trade agreements And I don't understand all I hear But I wasn't certain when the neighbors moved in And now I am glad they are here And this morning I want to fall down and cry This morning I don't need my fence I need my neighbor on the other side You might have heard something in the background Our, uh, our, our, our phone machine, I think it started talking to us while we were singing oh, to you. Sorry about that. about that. Noise. I think it was the phone machine. It was Charlie's birthday yesterday, so maybe one of his daughters is calling to say happy birthday. So the other song uh, that we'd like to sing for you is called The Land of 10,000 Mothers. I wrote this uh, a long time ago during the, uh, the first Iraq War, which I believe is like 92, 93. No, maybe you've earlier than that. 94, 95, 1, 
91. It's 1991. Okay. Um, maybe it's the second Iraq War then, because it was when they, um, all of a sudden, there were, I used to sit in the Manchester, New Hampshire airport. And uh, I was touring, and I, my folks lived in New Hampshire, and I lived in Utah, so I would fly in and out of the Manchester airport. And it was an airport where a lot of soldiers were going out for the whatever they were, whichever country we were, we were sending them to at that time. And I saw the most heartbreaking goodbyes at the gate. Um, and I can't remember why it seemed unusual to have families in the airport at that time, because it's before 2000. 9-11, but anyway, I was, very, I was just very struck by all the goodbyes that I saw of, of soldiers and their families. And at the same time, I had been teaching at a, an adult music camp in the hills of California with a lot of old hippies. And there were all these awesome women who were at that camp. And it was like being in the land of mothers. They all just took care of you. You know how women will just take care of each other and they take care of everybody nearby. It's a wonderful thing. And there was a young man who had grown up at this camp. His mother did the snacks at the camp, so he came every summer. And he didn't find all these women such an awesome thing. And he said to me once, it's like growing up with 7,000 mothers. And he didn't mean it in a good way. But I'd been reading the Tao Te Ching, where the 10,000 things is the magic number. So I thought, what about 10,000 mothers? That would be an awesome thing. In the land. Ten thousand mothers Every song is a lullaby And nobody marches to war No one stands in the airport and cries And nobody dies on the highway With too many words left unsaid We all sleep safe in our beds And in the land of ten thousand mothers Milk and honey flow without end And nobody goes away wanting You are welcome What a wonderful couple of songs, Cozy and Charlie. Thank you, thank you. Just, thank uh, you. I, I can't get enough of the, the two of you. And someday we'll be together, <laughs> not on this stupid <laughs> screen. It bugs me to no end, but it's, it's, uh, it's an okay um, substitute. And the emotion in the heart and the soul comes through strong and clear. So we have uh, this morning from way over in Yalta, Russian Federation, Regis Tremblay, and we have from right here in uh, Brunswick, Maine, I think it is, Bruce Gagnon. I think that uh, there's a community church Maine connection going on real strong. We have two members, really strong members. One is a board member. It's a uh, um, Alan Clements, who lives north of, of, of Bangor, and the other is, is Lenny Shames, and he has recently retired and moved to Brunswick, Maine, but both are still uh, uh, very fastidious members in spite of the distance. Uh, so 
And next Friday is um, John and Rachel Nicholas from Camden, Maine. There is a there's a Maine um, uh, focus going on here. So um, we are just so glad to have these uh, incredible two presenters. Regis, of course, has a Maine connection. He lived there for many years. Regis. Uh, has been to Community Church before, where we have seen some of his documentaries. He's a filmmaker, and Bruce is a, um, a marvelous activist uh, they, uh, in, in Maine, and he'll talk about that more. Um, so we're just going to dive into this, and uh, as usual at Community Church, it's a sort of a, a free-form thing. I want to thank Joan Livingston for suggesting this program, as well as Mary Kate Small, my my buddy, uh, who's married to one of my favorite uh, songwriters in the world, David Dodson, up in and also in Camden, Maine, for for um, wanting this to happen as well. Um, Regis Tremblay and Bruce Gagnon, and Regis is going to start out. Thank you for joining us. Well, uh, thanks for having us. Um, greetings to everybody from. Yalta in the Crimea of the Russian Federation. Um, I'm very happy to, uh, to be visiting with you today and very happy to be doing another show with my really good friend, uh, Bruce Gagnon. We've been down a lot of trails together and I would add that he's not just an activist. He is one of the best organizers, I think that has ever existed uh, anywhere but he's been at it for almost 30 years. So, and I also want to, uh, to thank um, Cozy and Charlie for their three wonderful songs. They're very, very moving. Um, I didn't have my picture on or my microphone on because I uh, didn't want to watch people, uh, have people watching me when I'm scratching my head or drinking my lemon juice. Anyway, uh, we talked a bit about, ahead of time about what we would talk about today, and we we kind of agreed we'd start out with Ukraine because I think the crisis in Ukraine is probably on most people's minds, at least in the northern hemisphere, uh, in America, North America, all across Europe. And there are friends of mine in in Africa and Australia and New Zealand that are very frightened at, at uh, where we are right now in the world in terms of the fast deteriorating. In fact, I think they've already deteriorated relations between the United States and Russia. Um, there are a lot of people, including myself, that think that war could break out at any moment. Um, I myself uh, am living in the Crimea, which uh, broke away from Ukraine uh, and through a referendum overwhelmingly voted to return to Mother Russia, where the Crimea had been since Catherine the Great in the time of our own American Revolution in 1776. So we are also threatened, but uh, it, it won't happen here. They Ukraine would never dare to attack here, and I don't think they dare to attack in the Donbass, but they have some 150,000 troops along the border with these two breakaway republics known as Donetsk and Luhansk, or the Donbass region. They continue to have military transports from the United States arriving, bringing in uh, more and more heavy artillery, more and more um, bunker buster bombs, uh, and and there are U.S. trainers, U.K. trainers, Canadian trainers uh, who are training the Ukrainian army. And I want to make it very clear, and I know that Bruce would probably chime in on this as well. Many of the battalions that are attack or ready to attack and have been attacking for the last seven years are neo-Nazis. They are full-fledged Nazis, really with swastikas on their equipment, with Nazi symbols on their uniforms. And these people are violent. Uh, they, they would like to purify Ukraine, just as Hitler wanted to purify Germany. And they want to kill all Jews. They want to kill all Russians. They want to kill all Christians. It's a very terrible and dangerous situation. Now, I'm going to make one point, and then I'm going to flip it over to Bruce and let him comment, because he, 
he's been here and he knows the situation. Um, you probably have heard, I hope anyway, in, on December 17th, the Russian Federation presented eight articles as a uh, mutual security agreement with the United States. As it turns out, these were not just negotiable items, they were demands from Russia for mutual security, not only in Europe, but also the United States. And what Russia basically wanted, there were three main things really. One, they wanted no more NATO expansion. And the NATO and the United States have been talking about Ukraine entering the, the NATO and Georgia. And Russia had said, that's a red line. If you cross that, we will act. The other thing that America, that uh, Russia was asking is for a return to the 1997 borders, which is when Germany was reunited, the Warsaw Pact fell apart, was dissolved, the Soviet Union was dissolved, and the United States had made promises, well documented now, of not to move one inch closer to Russia. And now they are directly on Russia's border with 13 former Soviet republics as part of NATO. That's an enormous threat to Russia. The third major thing that Russia wanted was for the United States to remove all of its missiles from the former Soviet republics where they, they are uh, located from Europe. And that is conventional missile, missiles and nuclear missiles together with all of the infrastructure. And what happened was the United States just categorically dismissed uh, these security agreements with Russia. And in the meantime, a couple of talks, Blinken and Lavrov, Wendy Sherman and an undersecretary of, of state for Russia. And these talks went nowhere. All the United States could continue to say was Russia has to stop the aggression. Russia has to stop threatening to invade Ukraine which are total, categorically false, straight out lies. So with that as kind of a background of what I'd like to have people become aware of, um, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend, Bruce Gagnon. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you all. Thank you, Dean and others for inviting us. And I want to second uh, Regis's uh, words about those songs, they were really beautiful. Thank you. I guess I'd like to start with a little more about the 2014 coup d'etat. <clears throat> it really started in late 2013 in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. I followed it on uh, uh, YouTube, basically videos being constantly posted, followed it daily. So I was really sort of there. And what happened was that the Obama administration uh, designated Joe Biden, uh, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, and Victoria Nuland, the US Under Secretary of State, to essentially uh, perform a coup d'etat in Kiev, getting rid of their elected uh, president. Uh, and uh, they used a process of color revolution that has <clears throat> become uh, well practiced throughout the former uh, Warsaw Pact countries, the former Soviet uh, allies, uh, where they go in and spend millions of dollars over a couple years period of time, uh, working with various NGOs and uh, getting them to uh, develop the techniques to overthrow a uh, country, the CIA, the, the uh, State Department, the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, George Soros' Open Society Foundation, all these various funders uh, put money into this process. Uh, Victoria Nuland uh, standing next to a Shell uh, oil sign at a symposium sometime after the coup was over bragged that the United States spent $5 billion on this Ukraine operation over a period of years. Uh, 
so anyway, the coup was uh, organized and it really was pushed forward. The violent part of it was pushed over by the Nazis that Regis mentioned. Uh, it's important to know that in Western Ukraine, there's a long history of Nazi worship. And when Hitler, um, this is the part of Ukraine that borders with Poland, by the way. And when Hitler invaded uh, the Soviet Union during World War II, he swept through Western Ukraine. And there was one of the, these leaders, these nationalist leaders by the name of Stefan Bandera, he put on a Nazi uniform and his followers joined the Nazis in killing uh, tens of thousands of Jews, Poles and ethnic Russians. And uh, not too long after this coup was accomplished in 2014 in Ukraine, Bandera was named as a national hero. Well, the first thing the new government did uh, after the coup was to outlaw the speaking of Russian in Ukraine. Half the country speaks Russian. And on the mostly on the eastern side, uh, they're predominantly Russian ethnic people living along the Russian border in this region of Donbass where Lugansk and Donetsk, the two largest cities are located literally on the Russian border. This is a coal mining region. And so the people of the Donbass began peacefully organizing marches and referendum campaigns saying that we want a federated Ukraine. We wanna be able to speak whatever language we want. And we also wanna elect our own local official, officials rather than having Kiev appoint them which was the common practice. Well, as soon as they did uh, this process, um, the Nazis were sent from Western Ukraine to Eastern Ukraine to attack these people uh, who were just, again, peacefully assembling. Uh, and so what happened was the miners came out of the coal mines they uh, grabbed whatever they could to try to defend their families against these Nazis. Over time, they were able to get some of the weapons from the Nazis uh, through various means. And then also Russia began to arm them. Russia didn't invade, but they did supply weapons to these, what I call self-defense forces. Uh, the media calls them Russian separatists but clearly they were defending themselves and their families against these Nazis. So in the end, what happened was kind of a stalemate arrived and they had a line of contact. It looks a lot like World War I trench warfare there on each side. And what uh, happened is the US and NATO continued to arm this uh, Ukrainian government, these Nazis with weapons. Uh, set up a training area in Western Ukraine. I hope Regis won't mind that I mentioned that his son, a Army Special Forces soldier, was sent there twice to this training camp in Western Ukraine to help train these Nazis that were being brought into the quote unquote Ukrainian Special Forces. The United States supplied nice uniforms. They put them on, they look like regular soldiers. And they uh, then were sent back to the line of contact where over all of these years since 2014, they've been shelling the Donbass. They've shelled the airport, train station, bus stations, hospitals, schools, churches, daycare centers, senior citizen centers, um, and uh, apartment blocks and rural uh, housing uh, neighborhoods. And over 10,000 people have been killed in this process. And now, as Regis said, there is 125, 150,000 of the Ukrainian military lined up on the Western side of this line of contact. Russia has indeed uh, lined up 125,000 or so soldiers on it in its own country, on, on uh, near the, not on the border with Ukraine, but near it, saying that we don't wanna invade Ukraine. It's a mess. Since the uh, coup in 2014, the IMF came in and uh, they were broke in Ukraine. They needed money. The IMF said, well, you have to sell everything off, all your national assets. 
including their topsoil, has been sold to Monsanto. You remember, Ukraine was the breadbasket of Europe, but it's now become a failed state because of this corporate looting that has followed U.S. and NATO coup d'etat. And so Russia is saying, look, you've, uh, the West has created this mess there. We're, we've got a big country already. We can't afford to invade and take over and take over this place. Let the West deal with it. But Russia says that if the Kiev does attack the Donbass, this Russian ethnic enclave essentially on Russia's border, then we will be forced to defend them. One last thing. I think we need to really understand, as Regis said about the NATO expansion, in Romania and Poland, the United States has built missile launch facilities, bases, and they can launch first strike attack cruise missiles, a weapon that is nuclear capable, flies below radar detection, and would be used to take out Russian uh, nuclear forces, command control centers, and everything else. If this isn't a Cuban missile crisis in reverse, I don't know what is. So this is the danger that we face today with all this uh, warmongering going on by the United States and NATO. Uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the Western media, NPR, CNN, MSNBC, The Washington Post, New York Times, they all say that Russia wants to recreate the former Soviet Union. Well, let's just look at the numbers for a minute. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute annually uh, measures uh, global military spending. In 2020, uh, the US spent a trillion dollars. When you add up all the various pots of gold, nuclear weapons spending is not inside the Pentagon budget. And there are lots of other hidden pots of gold, but when you add it all up, the US spends a trillion a year. How much does Russia spend on its military in 2020? 62 billion dollars, the equivalent of Germany or France. Now, is Russia going to be able to recreate the former Soviet Union? Imagine the war that would take at $62 billion a year. I think it's ridiculous. And it's just part of this uh, demonization that's been going on for a long time. And ultimately, why? what's going on? What's the reason for all this? I think it's climate change, the melting of the Arctic ice. Russia has the largest land border with the Arctic, more, bigger than any other country in the world. And the Western uh, Resource Extraction Corporations want to go and drill, baby drill, in that region. Well, the RAND Corporation has created a study calling for the balkanization or the breaking up of Russia into smaller countries, making it easier for these Western oil corporations to get in there and take control of the region. But in order to do this, they have to essentially encircle Russia, create chaos on their borders, according to this RAND Corporation study, and over time create this internal dynamic inside of Russia where the public becomes alarmed because Russia is having to spend so much money on uh, military to defend themselves against this steroidal uh, US and NATO. So I think that's what's driving it. I'm going to put in the chat uh, the link to this RAND Corporation study so you can see it for yourself and not think I'm just making all this up. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Yeah, great, Bruce. Um, pretty good lesson in history. I want to add just a couple of things, and then and I'm going to talk about some more background to this. Um, Bruce mentioned uh, that these neo Nazis and the Ukrainian army uh, back in 2014 didn't just shell with heavy artillery howitzers, but they had fighter planes at the time, and they were dropping bombs on these neighborhoods in Luhansk and Donetsk. Eighteen thousand innocent civilians, not soldiers, in those towns, in those neighborhoods were killed. I made a couple of films when I was in the Donbass. I was there twice for a total of a month. And in, in the films, I show the devastation, the destruction of apartment buildings. Bruce had mentioned gas stations, bus stations, trail stations, electrical power grids. Um, it was 
it was unbelievable how vicious the attack on these civilians um, was. So in terms of the $5 billion that Bruce mentioned that uh, Victoria Nuland bragged about, uh, they were going to give to Ukraine. Joe Biden talked about another loan that he said, if you don't fire the prosecutor who's going after my son, Hunter, you're not going to get this money. Well, I have a friend who was a political advisor to the first four presidents of Ukraine. He was in the parliament. He's now living in Crimea. He's an ethnic Russian. Uh, he told me he was there during all of these talks, and he was there during the coup, the Maidan, as it's referred to. And he shocked me, and I recorded this, and I, I'm going to have to finish getting it translated to get this out for the world to see. Of the $5 billion that, he, that, that the United States and Newland talked about, guess where that money went? It didn't go to the people of Ukraine. It didn't go to the government. It went to a particular oligarch, and the rest of it went to According to him, Joseph Biden, Victoria Nuland, Jeffrey Pyatt, the current, the then uh, ambassador, other high ranking people in the State Department and probably CIA. Now, you talk about fraud at the highest levels. You talk about treason. And Joe Biden has never been held accountable for this. And, and American people need to know about this, need to know how deeply serious this is, not just the corruption, but they are the ones who created this critical situation, this run up to war that we're experiencing today. I will add this. I know that it's been hyped all over the United States. I, I do a, a monthly Zoom meeting with some former classmates of mine. And the first thing they asked me was, they said, Regis, um, what's going on over there in Ukraine? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, it's all over the TV here today, uh, nowadays, 24-7. Well, I want to let people know that it is now all over Russian television, state television, and independent networks about the run up to war. Some of my older Russian friends living here in Yalta are so afraid, they're retired people, that they want to go to the banks and withdraw their money. The Russian central bank has actually posted something saying it feared a run on the banks. So this is serious. There's a lot of people that are taking this thing very, very seriously. Now, I want to back up a little bit. I made a film. Uh, it's called Who Are These Russians and Why Do We Hate Them? It actually began a little late in the game because the United States is not the first country to want to take over Russia, balkanize Russia, steal all of its resources. They made an attempt in the 1990s when George Bush won and his, his uh, Harvard banker boys and his CIA kids, because he had been head of the CIA, uh, they, they pillaged and raped Russia in the same way that they're trying to pillage and rape Ukraine and what they've done everywhere else. But from that time on, um, they've not been successful because of one, Vladimir Putin was elected president in the year 20, 2000, and he basically has shut all of that stuff down. America will never forgive him for that. But it goes back further than that. I started tracing it back to World War II. And after World War II, when Harry Truman became president, he immediately made Russia and Stalin the enemy. He undid a lot of good work that was done between Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin. And then I started to learn a little bit about Russian history. It goes back even before Napoleon, who tried to conquer Russia because of its enormous landmass, enormous natural resources. It goes back to Hitler, who wanted to conquer Russia for the exact same reasons. The Finns and the Swedes have tried to attack Russia. And then if you go back even further than that, you can go back to the Greeks who were here way back two, 3,000 years before Christ, the Byzantine Emperor, the Ottoman Empire. All of these people wanted a piece of this incredible landmass. And so Bruce was saying, right now, it's about oil. Well, it's not just oil. It's all of Russia's natural resources, oil, gas, vast resources in, in, uh, in gold and in silver, unlimited amounts of fresh water you can drink right out of a river or a lake. 
And this, this, this landmass, which when you look at it in terms of geography, it connects the Far East, China, with Portugal. And the Chinese have this initiative called One Belt, One Road, or the new, uh, the new Silk Road, which they are building infrastructure now, including high-speed rail that will travel from the Far East in China all the way to Russia, through many of the former Soviet republics, into Europe, and all the way to Portugal. This, the United States, as the world hegemon today, cannot allow to happen. So it's a very complex situation that really goes back centuries. And the Russians are a peace-loving people. There's nobody on earth that has experienced war like Russia has. Not only in World War II, where they lost 27 million people, civilians, millions of them. There is not a Russian family today that doesn't have a parent or a grandparent or an uncle who perished in that war. And so for the Russian people, they want no part of war. They want no part of invading anybody. They haven't invaded anybody. And as Bruce mentioned, they don't want any part of taking Ukraine and being responsible for cleaning up that mess. So I think it has to be emphasized over and over again, that Putin has been demonized, just like they demonize any enemy, whether it was Hitler or Saddam Hussein or uh, Gaddafi in Syria, it doesn't matter. That's part of the tactic. They demonize the leader and they, they make the leader appear to be all of the people. Well, I can tell you this, I don't think Putin is ready for canonization by any means, but Putin has been a a fiercely patriotic conservative Russian who has wanted to take care of Russia first. He has no intention whatsoever of recreating the Soviet Union. He's got enough to handle just with this enormous landmass. The words of Putin, if you go back and you study this for the last 21 years now, and the words of Sergei Lavrov, um, their, uh, secret their secretary of state, really, all they have been talking about for all this time is diplomacy and peace. They refer to America as our partner. No longer. I'll finish on this note. Recently, Russia has ceased calling Europe, European countries and America partners. They now refer to them as unfriendly nations. Bruce? You have to unmute, Bruce. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we're ready for questions. You, you need to. Uh, first, um, thank you, both Bruce and Regis. Uh, we get to hear one more song from Cozy and Charlie before we go into the questions and answers. And this is the moment where I usually hold up a beautiful basket down at the church and tell folks that um, we could use your help, be you a member or be you somebody who's joining us from New Zealand. Uh, th there is a, a website in the chat that gives you the possibility to um, help us via credit card or via PayPal or you can send us a check, a paper, old, old style paper check to our address, which I will also put in the chat. Um, and Cozy and Charlie, once more, we get to hear a song from you. It's just such a pleasure to have you as usual. Thank you very much. I, I have to confess that I let Charlie go skiing. He's been listening and he is, so my last song is me on my own because it's the best ski day of the year and you know, Charlie turned 74 yesterday, so he's got only so many ski days left. I just have been finding this conversation and this talk fascinating. Um, a lot of things I didn't know. It's just been really, I appreciate that this uh, talk has happened to inform us about things that we might not ever know. Here we are in our bubble of the United States. I don't know how this song fits in it, but it's, one, it's a song that I wrote over many years um, about trying to work out how, how, how we see the world and how we see the world seeing us. And is there somebody up there who's helping us? And are we, are, are we all on our own in any way in the universe? 
And I started writing this song in my 30s when I thought I had to solve problems, when I thought the song isn't going to be finished till it's solved. And I finished it in my 50s when I realized, you know what? I don't have to solve this. I can just present it. Say, so here is, here's what I see. So it starts with a friend of mine who's a painter. You can see his painting back there. Actually, that's one of his paintings, that red one back there. He's a pa painter in Moab, Utah. And he tells me he puts words under his paintings. He writes things under the painting before he starts it as a way of saying something to the painting or saying something about its intention. This is called Love on the Wing. I have a friend who paints love on his canvas and then paints it over sky blue. <clears throat> he says it is there to watch over and care and help his painting get through. If you are in his painting, it is a wondrous thing. Right overhead, love on the wing. It's been hard to cope since we made the telescope and we couldn't find God in outer space. It made sense to believe if God was there we would see and the world became a big empty place. And way up high in the blue of the sky Michelangelo painted that hand to watch over and care. Look up there, love we can We have a war between religion and science and we paint a death star and a rebel alliance it threw all the questions open wide what if there's nothing out there on our side and way up high in the blue of the sky some wondrous thing to watch over and care we look up there for a hand or a heart or a wing. Yesterday I found a feather on the bike path that runs through town. I can't say it's heaven sent, but right there on the pavement a bit of love fell from the sky to the ground. Here I am in this painting. It is a wondrous thing. Right overhead, love on. Everybody. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Cozy. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful, beautiful New Hampshire Sunday afternoon. And Charlie, you're excused to go skiing. Um, we've got a question and answer uh, and uh, rich conversation, I'm sure. If anybody wants to put up their hand or, or uh, ask a question in the chat, or even just put up their hand physically, uh, I can scroll through and find you uh, to, uh, to be involved in this conversation. Um, let's see, anybody in particular? Karen Klein has her hand up. Karen, go ahead. Unmute thyself, Karen, and I will uh, spotlight you. Uh, thank you both very much. Um, I'm trying to absorb everything I've just heard because it's all not familiar to me. I do read The Atlantic, The New York Review of Books. I listen to NPR. Uh, sometimes I listen to democracy now, maybe not often enough, but I am wondering why, and I suppose this information isn't coming out because it doesn't present our country in a very favorable light, 
So the New York Times, which I do not read, um, maybe won't be printing it. But where can people like me, other than the community church, at the community church, where can people, regular people, citizens, people who listen to the radio and the TV, where can we hear this? They won't know about your podcasts. They won't know about your YouTube things. Uh, some, where can people turn on a radio, turn on a television, and hear some of these truths? Because the drums of war are beating far too strongly here, and there's too much lack of information for people citizens to be able to make good protests to talk to our government. And I will listen to what you have to say. Well, Bruce, you would, take it away. I would say, number one, I put uh, the link to Oliver Stone's film, Ukraine on Fire, in the chat. Please watch it. Share it with friends and neighbors. Uh, you know, too many people have their activism in park or even in neutral. Well, we've got to put it into drive one as soon as possible because we're literally seeing our government and NATO play with a possible nuclear war. And that isn't gonna be good for any of us. We just learned in the last two or three days that there are 15 nuclear reactors in Ukraine. If the United States forces a war in Ukraine with 15 nuclear reactors, guess what's gonna happen? Europe will be flooded with radioactivity. It, even that will spread probably around the world. Uh, so uh, I also put my blog in there. If you follow my blog uh, day in and day out or once a week or whatever, you're gonna learn a lot about what's going on. I report about all, all kinds of things happening around the world that I'm involved in or that I care about. But, you know, Regis earlier mentioned Iraq war in 2003, shock and awe. We were told by the mainstream media that weapons of mass destruction were in Iraq. We heard that from all the mainstream media, right? Well, guess what? The corporations own the mainstream media. They have interests in essentially uh, fooling the American people. And uh, th this is the game. And it's gotten worse since 2003. Let me tell you that for sure. So, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos owns the New York Times, or excuse me, the which is it? The Washington Post? Washington and, Post. Washington, Washington Post. Post, okay. So, you know, that should tell you something right there. Yeah. Uh, Karen, thank you for your question. Um, I, I would add that uh, the reason I came to Russia for the first time in 2016, and have returned uh, four times since, and I'm living here now, that as a filmmaker, I wanted to counter the American narrative, which was all lies. And it is all lies. There's not one ounce of truth in anything that's coming from American media, from the United States government, from the State Department. Um, so everything that's Americans have been absorbing for decades now, decades. And I think it begins with the birth of this country that we've grown up being indoctrinated in school and in, in civic society, in church even, that we are an exceptional nation blessed by God. And God has endowed the rest of the world to, to us to take care of and manage in our image. This has created what America has become, started out as, and become a genocidal uh, nation bent on um, taking everything it wanted and needed from anywhere else in the world, regardless of who's there and who it belongs to, and have committed mass murder, tens of millions of people since the beginning of the United States of America, beginning with the Native Americans to the present day. I'm going to add this about news. Um, Bruce's blog is exceptional. I'd highly recommend that you, you take a look at that. Uh, most of all of my media content is on YouTube and it's free. There's over 500 videos over the last 12, 13 years that I've made. In the last few years in Russia, there's dozens. 
It's a lot of very valuable information. I have interviews with Russians, with Russian uh, former military people, Russian uh, politicians, Russian journalists, and Rus ordinary Russian people, university people. It's, a, it's an invaluable source to see Russia and Russians through my eyes as they really are. The other thing that I would recommend in terms of a source, I think that American people or European people or anybody that's interested should tap into Russian media. Now, TASS, T-A-S-S -S, dot or slash English will give you the official state news uh, from Russia. It's, it's excellent. Uh, there is RT.com, which is funded partially by the state, but it's in English, RT English. Uh, it's both a, uh, an online type of news format, but also they, they do video programs, which are really good and really interesting. Sputnik is another one. Uh, I think what people should try to do is get a variety of sources, not just from the West, but from elsewhere. Al Jazeera is another source. Uh, so it's really important for Americans to, to be informed. I'd recommend one, one more source that many, many uh, of you people probably know is Ray McGovern and also S. Brian Wilson. Uh, Brian uh, has a Facebook page. He will correspond with anybody. And finally, I would say, if you are on Facebook, find me on Facebook, Regis Trembley, because I post a great deal of very important information that I find and that others uh, of my friends around the world find, and then I repost it there. So, Karen, it's extremely important, uh, I think, for you uh, to try to find some of these sources, follow them, and share them with your friends. Charlie, go ahead. Hi. Um, many people complain about Putin as the leader of Russia. I maintain that the, uh, the United States essentially picked Putin to be their leader just by aggressively <laughs> pushing NATO, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, not breaking that promise of not one, one more inch of uh, Eastern European territory. And the aggressive policy is what put uh, Putin in, in that position. And uh, just as, uh, as an aside, uh, I put something in the chat, uh, a very interesting lecture on the uh, Battle of Stalingrad and a little bit more context for uh, the Russian participation in World War II in the chat. It's a very good lecture and highly recommend it. Yeah, thanks, well, Charlie. Uh, <laughs> that the United States put Putin in power. They put Yeltsin in power. They, they, they spent a lot of money to do that, but uh, I'm afraid Putin was not their choice. In fact, I, I'm, I'm editing a book now that this Russian that I talked about previously that, that I did an hour long interview with, um, he has studied a variety of uh, European leaders and he's written books on several and one on Putin and Somebody translated it into English and nobody would read it. So I'm editing that book for him. One of the things he says in the book, and, and this I found really interesting, because I've questioned some of Vladimir Putin's actions. His words are always impeccable and everything is nice and wonderful. But when you look at his actions, you, you question. And one of the things that had me questioning Vladimir Putin was the fact that he has been attending Carl Schwab's World Economic Forum for many years. Schwab just did a video recently where he said, our young global leaders such as Vladimir Putin, and he went on to mention Henri Merkel and Macron in France and even Trudeau in Canada. And, and this is what this friend of mine who wrote the book about Putin said to me when I said, you know, Putin's crossed over to the dark side. He, he's, he's betrayed his country and he's betrayed the world. And he said to me, don't forget this. Putin was a KGB spy in Berlin when it was Soviet territory. And he wined and dined with East German uh, politicians, with the SS and with everybody. And 
he was trying to get information. And he said, this is what Putin's doing now by attending the World Economic Forum and by wanting to join NATO. It's not that he's crossed over, but that he's a spy to bring back this information and help him figure out how to help Russia conform to whatever is happening in the world. I still have my doubts. You know, there was a lot of uh, discussion about Russia interfering in our last couple of elections, Russiagate, and it turned out that it, it was all just a bunch of BS. But nobody ever talks about when Yeltsin, uh, when he became uh, the president after the collapse of the Soviet, Soviet Union, he became president of Russia. And when it was time for him to run for re-election, polls were showing that the communists were going to win. Bill Clinton was president at the time. He wasn't very happy about this. So he, you might remember a guy named Dick Morris, a political operative, kind of a nasty guy. Well, Bill Clinton sent Dick Morris there to run uh, the campaign of Yeltsin. And they used all the kind of American tactics. A lot of money was pumped into the campaign from outside the country, I'm sure from the U.S., various sources. And so Yeltsin won re-election. So uh, clearly the United States interfered in that election in Russia. We interfere in elections all the time, all over the world. Uh, this is, again, why people around the world hate us so much, because we're such hypocrites. And everybody knows it largely except the American people. Yeah, Bruce, I'm going to add to that Yeltsin re-election. There's, there's a Time magazine cover with Yeltsin on the cover, full cover, and it said U.S. to the rescue. And it was about the United States helping <laughs> to, to get Yeltsin re-elected. I mean, you talk about the epitome of hypocrisy. This Time magazine cover, everybody should see that. Leonard, go ahead and unmute thyself. And Thank thee. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce and, and Regis, for very, very important information, um, some of which I knew and a lot of which I didn't know. Um, Regis, you started going to Russia in 2016. I was in Russia and Belarus in 2016 twice and was really quite shocked with uh, some of the things that I heard. Um, they were asking me what I thought about uh, Hillary versus uh, Trump. And um, I said, well, Hillary's not a bad candidate, but Trump is a fascist. And they said, oh, Trump is an oligarch. We can handle him. Um, <laughs> but as far as Clinton is concerned, we're really upset with what happened in Kosovo. And um, we don't, this is in Belarus. They said, we don't want uh, the Clintons to judge us as a failed state and come start to come bombing us the way they did Kosovo. So um, it was quite an interesting back and forth. And I'm also having a back and forth with two important um, writers on Russia in the United States. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Michael Averco and um, Craig Unger, who are on opposite sides of the of this uh, uh, this this question. Craig Unger um, has been uh, depicting Putin. He's written a book uh, 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 showing the corruption of Putin and, and characterizing him as a murderer. Um, whereas uh, uh, Michael Averco is asserting the the somewhat biased but largely truthful. Uh, reports of RT, as, as, as you mentioned. He, he, he's a very close follower of theirs. Uh, he doesn't speak Russian, so I have to take everything that he says with a grain of salt. But, um, and I, I do speak Russian, but, but not, not quite as well as, as, uh, as you guys do at this point, I would think. Um, but I, I'm troubled because I'm really on both sides of this. Uh, do, these friends of mine <clears throat> have been depicting um, Russia as, as, yes, as peaceful. Do you remember the song Khachatli Ruski of Aimli by uh, Yevtoshenko? And you know, this is from the 60s. I translated that in my high school uh, newspaper uh, and met Yevtoshenko later and, and, and shared it with him. It, do the Russians want war? No, the Russians don't want war on all the memories of, 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 uh, of what happened through World War II. And, and um, they are a, a, a peace-loving nation. On the other hand, we do have these terrible things that have been happening. Um, well, I mean, my teacher, Carol Husa, wrote a piece that had over 7,000 performances over the world. It was called Music for Prague. And it was about 
the Prague summer, then the an invasion of the Russian troops just, just destroying the, 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 the Prague Spring. It's very difficult, even for people that love Russia, to remember what happened in Prague and uh, not to feel that, that the, the Russians are, are definitely a threat, even if uh, the people are, are largely uh, uh, peace loving. One other thing I want to mention, when we visited um, the cemetery where Yeltsin is buried, it was very interesting to hear what the guide had to say in Russian to uh, tourists. She said, in Russia, we don't, it, it's a tradition not to speak ill of the dead. But when President Yeltsin died, he issued an apology for what, to the Soviet people for his mistakes. So uh, th there's an awful lot of turmoil there. And it, 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 it's also difficult to peer, peer, I, I, Ray McGovern in, 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 in the, at the community church program, I remember he spoke and he was uh, giving some credence to the um, laptop that was found uh, with Hunter Biden. Uh, whereas if that laptop had been discredited by mo uh, almost all the media, and uh, he was saying, well, no, there is something there and there is something to the, the, the corruption charge against Biden. Uh, it was my impression that Biden had actually um, represented the United States in trying to get uh, uh, a corrupt uh, prosecutor replaced and that that prosecutor was replaced by somebody who was going to investigate Hunter Biden, not the other uh, way around. But no. uh, you, 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 can, you can enlighten us on that, I think, even more than, than I, we know at the moment. Let me start. Let me start first with Putin. Um, you know, I've been here now for two full years, but you know, four years coming here all in total. I made it a point because my American friends, when I came here, they said you need to ask these certain questions. The first one, the very first one, was, "What do Russian people think about Vladimir Putin?" And I can tell you this very honestly: there are a significant number of Russians. Uh, Soviet era Russians who do not like Vladimir Putin because they feel he's not done enough for the middle class and working Russians and the poor, that he's favored the oligarchs, big business. They also suspect that he may have ties to a, a liberal Western leaning faction. Nobody that I have met says that Vladimir Putin is corrupt. Nobody. There's been stories that he's got the, the richest man in the world with stored up all this money offshore somewhere. The Russians do not believe that at all. And, you know, you can't fool a Russian. You really can't. The other thing that I'm going to want to say, because I don't want to canonize Vladimir Putin. I, I don't know him well enough. Uh, his public presence and his speeches are incredible, fascinating to, to watch. They're all on YouTube. But Russia is no longer communist and has never been atheist. And so when people equate what happened in Yugoslavia or not Yugoslavia, in, in uh, Prague, or that the Soviet Union gobbled up all this territory in Poland and Czechoslovakia and everywhere else, Russia is no longer communist and is no longer the Soviet Union. People have got to understand that. I've seen it with my own eyes. And I can tell you this. Russia is a capitalist country. And it's a Christian country. The people, the churches today, are spring, new churches and churches that were destroyed have been rebuilt. New churches are growing up everywhere. People, you see people wearing little crosses all the time. And so people have got to realize that they cannot take and project on today's Russia what happened during the Soviet era? It, there's none of that. Putin is not Stalin. Putin doesn't kill anybody. He doesn't have to kill anybody. They automatically say, well, he's a KGB guy, so he's an assassin. You know? What about the, po the, po the poisonings that we've heard about? Oh, uh, that's a laugh. Come on. If Russia, if Russia wanted to kill somebody, if Putin wanted to kill somebody, they'd kill him. And so this is, again, one of these trumped up things, certainly by the CIA you know, maybe the United States State Department, uh, the Sherpas over in England, wherever it was, <laughs> it's a joke. And Russians, Russians cannot believe how stupid Americans are to believe this stuff. Uh, uh, anyway, Bruce, you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, uh, I agree. You know, the Skirples, they had been in England for several years and supposedly 
the Western story was that Putin wanted to kill the Skirples because they were giving out uh, um, information about uh, the you know Russian military. Well, information that would have been years old at that point. You know, it's just ridiculous. It's the last thing Putin wants to do. He's got enough problems dealing with the West to go around killing people and then getting more sanctions thrown on him. I, I believe those were CIA and MI6 operations. There's no question in my mind about it. Uh, and the same with Navalny. Navalny ran for president and he got 1% of the vote, but the West makes it sound like he's the most popular politician in the country. You know what I mean? The, this is what we do. And the American people, even liberals, just keep lapping it up, lapping it up like a dog at the bowl. You know, it's just ridiculous. But I want to tell this Putin story. I've seen it on a video. When he became president, it was after Yeltsin and Clinton and the Harvard boys had turned over a lot of the assets of the country to oligarchs. And so Putin had a meeting with these oligarchs and he said to them, OK, uh, I'm not going to take away your, you know, what you have. But if you don't pay your people well, if you don't treat your employees really well, then I'm going to come after you. Well, and, and, pay were, ta and pay your taxes and, oh, pay yeah, your taxes yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and stay out of government, stay out of politics. Uh, and uh, yes, thank you, Regis. And so some of them, a couple of them said, F you, uh, Putin, we're going to do whatever we want. And they began not paying their taxes and doing all kinds of other things and treating their exploiting their workers. And so Putin went after them. And he charged them for crimes. And uh, one guy, I can't think of his name, it was Kosadovsky or something, you might know Regis, but he's like, oh, the West loves him now. He was in jail for a while. And now he's out, in the, he lives in London or whatever. And uh, oh, the West loves him. He's the greatest guy in the world. Well, he's taken his money, a lot of his money, and he's created these NGOs and he funds things like, regime change in Ukraine, and he's tried to fund regime change in, in, uh, in uh, Russia, like guys like Navalny, that's where they get their money from people like him. Uh, you know, when they, Navalny buses in all these people from around the country, he might get 10,000 at a protest in Moscow. And uh, people say, you know, these are just kids with no jobs and no money. And so people say, where did you get the money, you know, to do all this? Well, it's coming from these sources, from these oligarchic sources that want to get rid of Putin and go back to the, the days of control and uh, like it was under Yeltsin. So I personally uh, uh, have been impressed overall with Putin. Uh, and I'm not an easy mark. I mean, I, I'm a cautious person. I study things very carefully. I make sure I know what I'm talking about before I open my mouth. I don't like to get caught on a, you know, on a mis, misstatement or a mis uh, whatever. So, uh, you know, I'm, I, I've been studying this stuff for quite a while. I've been to Russia about three times. I've been to Donbass once, I've uh, been to Crimea twice. Regis and I went to Odessa in 2016. We haven't talked about that at all. In 2014, soon after the coup, people in Odessa were organizing a referendum campaign uh, to say they, you know, they, they speak Russian there. And, you know, the same thing, we want a federated Ukraine. And they, there's a trade union hall, big building, and there's a beautiful park in front of it. And they were in the park tabling, as we call it, uh, getting signatures because a lot of people are walking through the park. And uh, some Nazis were brought in from the Western side of the country, hundreds of them, and they attacked these people. And so the people ran inside of the trades hall to escape these Nazis. And then the Nazis started throwing Molotov cocktails, uh, breaking the windows, uh, things like that. And so, soon the uh, trades hall was on fire, smoke billow billowing out of the windows and people couldn't breathe. And uh, so they started, you know, coming out onto the ledge, the window ledge, you know, and there were people on the ground shooting at them. 
and some of them actually jumped to the ground. And when they hit the ground, these Nazis were taking bats and rods and beating them to death. The fire station was a few blocks away. Fire truck tried to come, but the Nazis blocked the fire truck, wouldn't let them come in. And so there were a huge number of people that died. Or, and, and then nobody was arrested. There's all kinds of video. I watched it basically in real time on YouTube. You go on YouTube and it's in Odessa uh, 2014 trades hall. You can see the whole thing. And uh, um, so the, uh, no, one, no one was ever convicted. No one was ever tried. No one was ever brought to court for, for any, of these, any of these things they did. But uh, who were arrested were people that escaped the trades hall, came out, they jumped to the ground. People helped, some people helped them. They didn't get beat to death. But uh, it, it was unbelievable uh, th that uh, this happened. And many, so some of these people were put in jail and to this day have never been heard from again. This is what we're dealing with in Ukraine. I've got to go with an important phone call. You all forgive me for leaving. I'm sure Regis can take it from here. Thank no, you very much Bruce. for having me. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, Dean, this is Alan. Can I, can I chime in on the phone? Alan, Homer, Homer Frank is next, and then you, okay? Okay. Yeah. Uh, let, let me let me jump in. I want to I want to oh, okay. say a couple of things. Yes, we just, and then home. Uh, yeah. Um, ever since 2016, when I started coming, well, 2015, when I started to research all this about Russia to make my film uh, "30 Seconds to Midnight," which was about the possible con nuclear conflict between Russia and the United States, um, I started looking on YouTube. And I've watched just about every State of the Union message Putin has given, wonderful English uh, translations, not subtitles. And I've watched his annual press conferences that he has in front of some 400 foreign and Russian journalists without an earpiece, without a lawyer next to him, without notes, right off the cuff. It's unbelievable. If you want to know about Russia and, and Putin, uh, just search for some of these Putin uh, meeting with international journalists. The other thing I want to say, because we haven't talked about Crimea, and this is where I'm living now and why I came here. What you people in America know, if you know anything, is that Russia invaded and annexed Crimea. That's a total fabricated lie. I know. I'll tell you, I'll tell you briefly what happened. In 2014, right after the massacre in Odessa that Bruce was talking about, can you still hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right after the massacre, these neo-Nazis were coming from Odessa into the uh, Crimean Peninsula. There's a very narrow passageway there. And they wanted to do the same thing in Crimea, is totally upset and take over the parliament there and to create the same havoc and fear that they had done in Kiev and in Odessa. Tens of thousands of Crimean volunteers, men and women, went to the border and turned these people away. There's a lot more to that story that many Russians who were leaving uh, uh, Kiev and trying to come back into Crimea, their buses were burned, they were killed, the ones who live, some of them are forced to eat glass. They turned German shepherd dogs on them. So what happened was the people of Crimea uh, and two leaders, especially that were in the parliament said, we don't, we don't want any part of this. We don't want any part of what's happening in Ukraine and Kiev. What are we going to do? Well, we, we want to be independent. And, and they had some good legal resources. And what they did is they decided to hold a referendum a vote. And it was moved up on two occasions so they could get this done fast enough because they were terrified that Ukraine was going to invade. They had a referendum. Some 80% of all people in Crimea, I think it was 89%, voted. 98% of those people voted to return to Russia. What did they base their decision on? They based the decision, sanctified by the United Nations, is the right of every people to self-determination. That was not the case in Kosovo, not whatsoever. 
Russians are saying, Crimeans are saying double standard. So they sent their, the results of their referendum and a plea to President Putin to accept them back into the Russian Federation, where they had been since the time of Catherine the Great. It was in the 1950s that Nikita Khrushchev, who deeded, gave Crimea to Kiev to manage organizationally. Yeah. When he was drunk. He, need, <laughs> he needed some political oh. points for whatever reason, okay? And, and so he did it without the approval of the Duma, the, the Soviet uh, governing body. And so that transfer was illegal in the first place. He couldn't do it. But at the time, it didn't matter to anybody because it was all Soviet Union. To them, it was all one country with these different republics. And so what happened was Putin signed it immediately. He got the Duma to approve it. And Crimea legally, according to international law in the United Nations, returned to Russia. And I can tell you this. When I first came here in 2016, the infrastructure was in terrible disrepair. People were without electricity and some without lights. Uh, the roads were horrible. They used to joke about the roads. Since I've been here now, this is since 2016 to now, 2022, uh, the roads are super highways. They're better roads than we have in America. They have new electrical power stations, electrical grids. Uh, Russia has been dumping billions and billions of dollars into uh, development, economic development, building new apartment buildings, new hospitals, new schools. I've seen all this with my own eyes. And if you ask any person in Crimea, are you happy to be back in Russia? And they're all Russian speaking, by the way. They're ethnic Russians. They say, absolutely. There are a few who consider themselves Ukrainian. There's been intermarriage for all these years. And it has divided families. And it has divided uh, friends. Some of my friends that were friends or relatives with people who no longer talk to them, they've disowned them, they've moved back to, to Ukraine for the most part. And so it's important for American people to understand there was no invasion. One more point, there's a large military base called in Sevastopol. It's been Russia's only warm water base uh, for its Navy. It's, it's an enormous base. And when Khrushchev deeded Crimea to Ukraine, the Russian country uh, uh, under contract with Ukraine could keep 20,000 Russian Navy personnel in Sevastopol working together and side by side with Ukrainians. And so when the United States or Europe or NATO or says Russia invaded, the 20,000 military troops were already in Sevastopol. So last thing I have to say about that. Go ahead, Homer. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Regis and Bruce, for some very valuable information. Uh, really appreciate it. It's one of the reasons that I love community church. Um, but I have a, I have a question. Um, nobody uh, would uh, accuse or mistake you and Bruce for being American liberals. Uh, where would you put yourselves on the political spectrum? Um, I'm afraid of liberal. I'm afraid of conservative, the terminology. Uh, I'm afraid of progressive because I think these, these labels don't really mean much anymore. Uh, well, how I have defined myself uh, for many years now is I, I, the place of my birth was the United States of America. I love the American people. I love my country. It, it made me what I am today but I now consider myself a citizen of the world. Good. And my, my, politics, my politics are peace and justice. Simple as that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alan, thank you. you're next. Go ahead. Hi. Hi, Reed. Thank you, what, a what, a, yeah, what a wonderful segue to it. I wanted to say, uh, you know, these labels aren't really workable in a sense. They're, they're constructs of, of a power structure that wants to put us in a certain place. And the, the, the values of peace, harmony, cooperation, I mean, those are 
those are just outside of any political designation, or they should be. Um, but anyway, uh, thanks, Regis and, and Bruce. I know you're not there. Um, thank you so much for, for coming today and sharing. Um, I, I did want to say, just to make an observation that, you know, in this, here we, we're getting to the third decade of this millennium, and as is, is climate change is uh, becoming more and more apparent, it's been apparent for a while, but more and more in, in more and more people's uh, daily lives, uh, you know, we have a government that is still hell-bent on dominating the planet, uh, as they have for the last couple hundred years, and, and certainly through the world wars and so on. But, um, you know, at a, at a time when we should be, as Americans, and an American country, is, is we should be addressing our existential threat of, of too much carbon in the atmosphere, um, you know, what they, what they were continuing the game of domination. And now they're really, they're taking on Russia, they're taking on China. And so, you know, I think we, of course, need to keep ourselves informed all the time, and, and we need accurate information. But more importantly, something that Bruce mentioned about people's activism being sort of in neutral or park, and where it really should be in drive. And so I, I just want to say, you know, what I do is, you know, I, I get involved, and I, I sometimes I don't do that much, but I very systematically make sure that I'm involved in any number of different communities of activism and again, not necessarily political activism, but, um, pers you know, pursuing these values, these human values that are, are life sustaining. So, you know, being of course, uh, active in community church is one thing people can do, but also in new England, we have so many defense contractors, uh, Raytheon, in Massachusetts, of course, is is probably the largest. In Maine and Connecticut, there's General Dynamics uh, building submarines and, and destroyers uh, in Bath, Maine. And search, the, you know, I just suggest to people search out these people. Mass uh, Peace Action, for example, uh, you know, find your place somewhere uh, where you can make a difference and and be in community with people that are, that share these values, regardless of their political stripes or, or preferences. And <clears throat> along with that is something that Regis is doing, uh, Bruce is doing too, but, but being a global citizen, not just a, a warm, fuzzy feeling in your, in your mind, but take the contacts and the communities you have with, with people around the globe and talk to them and develop them and nurture those relationships because we simply cannot depend on our corporations and our governments to be, to be doing this. It's we're, we're going to have to do it ourselves and it can be a whole lot of fun. And it, it, it does, it's not like a, a drudgery of a, of a, of a task or something. It's like, this is sort of the fabric of humanity and we need to all be part of it that way because we simply cannot, trust our so-called leaders and our leading institutions to do it. And um, so this church is a good place to start and uh, continue. Thank you. Yeah. Who, who? I didn't see anybody on the screen. Who, who, who is just talking? Regis, this Alan. is Alan Clements. Yeah. Yeah. We might've, we might've crossed paths down in Bath at Bath Ironworks a few times. Okay, Alan. Okay. Uh, All I can yeah. say is you it, know, I, I agree with, I agree with everything you said wholeheartedly. Uh, I do think climate change, and I think Bruce t tonight probably wanted to talk about climate change. Uh, it, it's it's um, one of the only two existential threats to li to life on the planet, and the first is the threat of nuclear a nuclear Armageddon, and the second is climate change. Um, and there's hardly anybody in the world, including here in Russia, where people are are even talking about it. And if you don't like climate change, it's environment or environmental degradation. We can see it everywhere. We can see that the weather mm. has changed. And uh, in my opinion, uh, has has human activity accelerated it? Probably. Is it cyclical? It goes back ice ages and ice ages. Yeah, I think we're in a transition period to another to another uh, cycle. And I I wanted to uh, I, I wanted to add. Uh, one more thing, and now I'm scratching my head because I there was a lot that you mentioned. Oh, what people can do, uh, Alan. Even the simplest thing 
that a person can do, that they have time for, or they're well enough to do, is important. What's important is, is that everybody does something, and eventually it will continue, I believe, to spread. There are some people like me who are involved in media, and media is a tremendously powerful tool, as is this this uh, community church show that we're doing right now, incredibly powerful. You, you don't know who's who is, 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 this is reaching out to and who it's af- affecting. And you mentioned how much fun it can be. I created a monster a few months ago. I had the bright idea that, you know, I have all these friends around the world who have been watching my films and following me. Many have contributed to me being able to make some of these trips. And I thought, you know, I'd like to get these people together. Now that we have Zoom and we have this virtual reality, connect people all over the world simultaneously. I said, I think I'm going to put this a little advertisement out on YouTube and Facebook that I, I'd like to form a group, <coughs> excuse me, that I'm calling um, Global Friends, My Global Friends. Anybody that would like to join, maybe a monthly meeting where we can just talk about what's going on, where we're at and how we're feeling. I was overwhelmed. I created a monster because now to try to do a conversation with 30 or more people in an environment like this is is too challenging. It's not effective. So I only mention this, this, that that the people who have joined the group come from all over the world, uh, from the northern hemisphere, the west, the southern hemisphere, east and west. Uh, It's an incredible variety of people, people from Russia even. And what everybody says is that we appreciate the solidarity. We appreciate the connection between us because we haven't had anything like this. And so based on my experience, and there's no way that I can make this group any larger, uh, think about it yourselves. Anybody with Zoom can do this. Uh, So it's a very powerful way to connect a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks, Alan and and uh, Regis as well. Um, we might be uh, coming to the end of uh, a wonderful, really interesting program. I want to tell everybody that I am going to copy and paste uh, all of the links that were that are on the chat. It's a lot of a lot of information there. It will be on our YouTube channel. The chat under our, our the, uh, this YouTube talk. Um, and um, you can find it at Community Church of Boston official um, uh, under the YouTube uh, platform. Um, what else can I say? Um, this is um, this is a broadcast now. We today we don't have anybody at the church. It's closed. We're just we're we're continuing uh, to do a broadcast and. Um, we want to do a broadcast with more elegance, grace, and style, and we invite everybody here to help us figure out how to do that and help us figure out how to be more effective activists. We invite people to help us form a program. Uh, we invite people to help us figure out what we're going to do with all those books down in the auditorium. Come down any Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, uh, and I will give you a, a guided tour of this wealth of books that we have down there. Um, uh, again, um, join us, and um, we're we're just glad you're here. We were once. Uh, what, what we might call a leftist megachurch, we would meet in Symphony Hall. There would be 2,000 people who might come to hear the likes of W.E.B. Du Bois or Martin Luther King or Thurgood Marshall. We are now a, a group of maybe 30 people on Zoom and YouTube, but it, what's the quote from Margaret Mead, which is never underestimate what a, a small group of well-organized people can do to change the world. Um, does that sound like a, where, uh, a place that we can um, agree to to declare the meeting over and, and thank Cozy and Charlie for being with us and thank Regis and Bruce for, for this thank you, Dean. amazing presentation and thank Kevin and Homer and Dick 
Kashishin on the phone and Richard Crowley and Dave Lewitt and Ruth Kaplan and Ken Casanova and Karen and Charlie. Thank you for your, your tech um, uh, skills in making this happen. Susan Nye, Leonard Lerman, Larry Sr., Barry Warner, Mary Lynn, Lynn Siegel, Joan Livingston for suggesting this program. Mary Seferian, Alan Foster, Alan Clemens, and that last one is Lenny Shames from Brunswick, Maine. That's, um, that's a rich bunch, and there's more of you joining on YouTube. Can I make a concluding Bruce, comment? Can I make one concluding Bruce, comment? Bruce, take it out for us. No, it's Regis. Regis, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I Dean, I, I, I want to I thank you for the invitation to take part in this. Uh, it's not only been a pleasure, it's, it's really been an honor to, to be with all of these great people that you have um, assembled at the community church. Um, uh, Cassie and Charlie, I don't think they're here anymore, but uh, I want to thank them for providing the music. And all I can say uh, in conclusion is two things. One, keep looking into ways you can use the media, Zoom, to get your message out. It, it, it's free. People have all, eyes, all kinds of ideas. You can use your smartphone. The last thing I want to say is Das Vidanya with love from Russia. All right. Das Vidanya with love from the United States back at you, Bruce. And say that one day, someday we'll be together physically, not just with these rectangles on the screen, but for the time being, that's what we'll we'll make do with. Someday we'll be together, meeting at the building, soon be over, all over this world. Thank you, Bruce. Meeting at the building, soon be over, all over this world. Thank you, Regis. Meeting at the building, soon be over, all over this world. Thank you, Cozy and Charlie, and all of the rest of you join us today all over this world and look for the links on the youtube channel and spread the word okay folks do good work dean are you a member of veterans for peace do i see that on your hat no on my hat is a is a, oh. uh, a lighthouse on swans island oh okay lighthouse on swans island uh, where i go every summer and spend a, a, a few days at a festival uh, but I'm certainly a, a lover of Veterans for Peace, and they, they join us, and we have several members who are members of Community Church. Long live Veterans for Peace, long live Mass, Act, Mass Peace Action, and long live Community Church. And uh, shall we say goodbye to everybody? And I'm going to proceed to put all of these, uh, these comments in the chat. Okay, folks, take care. You see the smoke? I hope it doesn't <laughs> set off the smoke alarm. <laughs> All right. Bye now. And anyone who's still there and wants to say hello, I'm going to just leave the thing on while I go and copy and paste into the YouTube channel. Nick, are you still on the phone? I see Dick Crowley. Are you still there, Dick? Oh, no. No, you're no. gone. Okay. <laughs> If you're gone, how come I still see you and I still hear you? Let's see. I'm going to Safari. I'm going to turn off the... If you can hear him, he's still there. Hi, Joe. Hello. Hi, Dick. Hi, Joe. Can you hear me? I sure can. Dean was saying everyone's on, but I'm hearing, I'm hearing the people who stay later. Yeah. Um, so... Please, Dean, that you met you and Charlie, that we all got it together for Bruce and Regis, who are incredibly awesome people and knowledgeable. What is I've taken all the links really? and posted them, including the YouTube, so other people will know to look in at this awesome presentation. Yeah, yeah. 
and we will do the same. Including the Oliver Stone movie, which um, Regis sent, and then um, so did Bruce. It's on my Facebook page. It's about an hour long. It's a kind of his, it's historical. It goes back to, you know, old time Soviets, and then what's, you know, all the color revolutions, the, the Rose Revolution, the Orange Revolution, et cetera. Um, so Soros has generally, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Anyone who thinks Russia messes with our elections doesn't know what, who we mess with. While we're Thank still you. here, I'm. Uh, Are you I'm broadcasting from home? I'm broadcasting from home. Yeah, we didn't. Snow nobody, day, right? Nobody at nobody at the church. Uh, Luis and uh, and Thurman did the snow removal. You making pupusas just for you? No pupusas today. <laughs> no pupusas. Um, and I'm doing these YouTube edits. Oh, I already put up the link. Don't know that too much. I hope I got your link before I uh, copy it. Everything and people it out. put in chat, I put on Face or Meta already. Facebook got rebranded. Yeah, what was the what was the reason? Just there we go. The Sunday meeting is. Uh, yeah, so they always say that it's not very yeah. descriptive. So I was writing an intro. Uh -huh. Good job. This is Joan, how how's how's it going for you? Day by day, like everyone else. Thank you. Uh huh. One day at a time. Same for yeah. me. Well, that's what people who are in programs say, but it's more. I'm just an old person, you know. Life's too short, and then you die. Yeah. So drink in every moment. One so day at a time. What are you going to do with your one wild and precious life, Mary Oliver? Mary Jennifer Oliver. Knows. Yes. Jennifer, who calls me a lot, says that knows that one. <laughs> it sure does. Yeah. And um, is this you and me? And oh, we got we got. Three if you're into poetry, uh, Joan, sometime, uh, pretty soon we're going to have all of Bob Dottilio's books out and on display. There's still like twenty boxes that we haven't even opened yet. Wow, there but, were so um, many. It was their first night. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 crazy, uh, but. Um, come by and, and enjoy his enormous selection of poetry. Uh, he didn't have any Mary Oliver though. Well, I think that's not hard to um, take care of. And what I can't figure out- I was... had books to donate to the church, but if nobody's there, what's the point? You know, wait, but- um, yeah. Well, you know, somebody will be there answers. again soon yeah. sometime. Right. Um, and I can't figure out why he was so obsessed with Ezra Pound. A lot of people so, were obsessed with Ezra Pound. Even, even fighting with the FL in the captain's tower. That's an old joke. Fighting with what? With <laughs> Ezra Pound fighting with T.S. Eliot in the captain's tower. That's an old joke about U.S. high culture and low culture. Uh huh. I won't waste your time explaining it. Yeah, interesting. Zimmerman. I can't seem to get to my uh, community church editing mode, um, which is frustrating. I was going to go ahead and copy and paste into into the uh, the editing mode. Oh, editing it maybe it's time. maybe it's because I'm I'm in the wrong channel. How to do it? Um, I'm in I have own. a subscription to CCB's YouTube, and I also, for anyone who's interested, and they should be, I subscribe to Regis's, which are usually called Global oh. Conversations. Yeah, um, it's interesting you say that. Um, uh, David Rovix has been telling me uh, mm -hmm. push push subscribing people subscribing to your YouTube channel. 
he claims that when you get to a thousand, you reach some kind of threshold and, and you're, they, they promote you a lot more somehow. He's, he's this, losing Spotify for bizarre reasons. Yeah, Spotify. I, I've got to a couple I've of people said out to boycott now. Spotify and they're getting boycotted. So David was looking around for other platforms. There aren't that many, you know? Yeah, there aren't that many. Um, Neil Young, who hates streaming, he says, and he was mad about, you know, something another person said and said everyone should boycott Spotify. As a result, he's off of it. So is Joni Mitchell. And they're losing money. But it's odd. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's over a word that's um, heavily, heavily censored, the, the V words. Do you, do you know anything about, about this back. guy, Joe Rogan? Yeah, recently he's been, I mean, Ken asked me that recently, and he's always a subject of conversation to one reason or another, but most recently he seemed almost single-handedly to kill off spot, well, Neil Young was involved. David did a, you know, one of his podcasts on it. David Rovix. Yeah, our David. Our David. Right. I'll, I'll, I mean, I've never heard Joe Rogan. Rogan. I don't know anything about him. I've never heard him either. The, but, is, it, is he kind of like a, an Alex Jones kind of a... Well, nobody's David. Alex Jones, I don't think. He said yeah. a few things. I mean, I had never heard of him, but all of a sudden people were talking about him all the time on different YouTube channels. And Ken asked me the other day when I was in the back of the car with the mask, what did I think of Joe Rogan? And I was like, I don't know. A lot of people seem to be talking about him. So I Googled for what was going on. Most recently, it's actually, that's all on my page, same as this presentation, but David's uh, commentary is there along with what Neil Young said and how Spotify is now losing money. He called for a boycott. Well, is Spotify really lo losing money just because they, I, I mean, they well, lose, lose a tiny Neil bit Young of money because they lose. Neil Young hates streaming services. <laughs> he is, he's always saying, you know, that you lose everything from vinyls. But he said, it's me or Rogan and everyone quit him and Joni Mitchell over something stupid. To stay up to date, just go to my page. You're there right now. Uh-huh. He had previously made some comment about skin color that got uh, people upset. I think people are so sensitive these days about everything. Label censorship. Yeah. Oh, Boston digs out after almost two feet of snow, says the cryon. Dean's at home and warm, so am I. I'm in bed. <laughs> My favorite way to zoom in bed. That's a nice way to go to church. Yeah, well, I keep thinking to go there physically, but I guess with snow, it's not as possible. No. Well, as soon as there's the snow has abated, just stop in. You're so nearby. Just you know. come and come and say hello. Um, Are you there always? I came um, to warm up on first night. <laughs> I seem to be there at least Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And uh -huh. other days, other days, I like to be there because there's nobody there. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, there's, well, thank you. you know, <clears throat> Luis and, and Crystal. Uh, Luis comes in Wednesday and Friday these days, and um, and it's nice when it's when it's really quiet and nobody else is there. And what I said, when you can hear yourself think, right? Yes, that's right. It's stuff done. That's right. Let's see. There's, is there anybody else? I'm very I... happy they covered all the Putin bashing. It's like uh -huh. we went through Russia Gate and Ukraine Gate. It's all the, the word fake news. That was Hillary, why she lost. And then, it, you know, Putin had nothing. I mean, a consortium, Bruce put up the link, but from 2016 on, veteran intel pros like Ray have said physically impossible. The hack. Well, I can't figure out how to. It's, I'm not able to get on to my. Um, well, let me leave you alone and go tend to my page. 
see that you're all, everything's set up there, right? Yeah, um, my uh, YouTube editing doesn't seem to be working. Maybe Google is, is, is cutting a fart of some kind. They're not- I hate when, when mechanical over. things fart. Inappropriate. Yeah. They're, they're, they're pretty stinky ones. <laughs> Keep yeah. it clean. Yeah. Um, I'm glad my lights are on. The TV says thousands without power in the East Coast. Oh, really? Yep. I'm not one of them. No, I've Maybe got power too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've only ever gone without power two days at a time, and that's enough to ruin everything in a refrigerator, you know? Now you have a whole house.